Welcome back to another installment from our third panel forum, all about improving our reptile husbandry and the care for our animals. I had experts Trace Harden, Riley Jemison, and Mariah Healy on. If you want to know more about them, check out the full video. I'll put it up here so you guys can check that out. Uh, that way you get an introduction to who they are and, and get their background a little bit before we jump right into this question. But I asked them about two things in particular. I asked them what they thought about bioactive, because it's a really big popular trend and it seems to be all over Facebook. and uh, the, the message boards and that sort of thing today. Everyone's talking about bioactive. Uh, well, first, I think if you don't know by now what it is, uh, they're going to give you a quick introduction to what it means to be bioactive. But more importantly, how that's beneficial, how it can help, and is it right for you? Right? It's a good question to ask. So uh, the experts weigh in on that. Then I ask them to tell me where they want to see reptile keeping go in the future. So they hit all the important stuff: biosecurity, cage sizing, bioactive enclosures. This is really, really important stuff. And I think if you watch any segment from these videos, this is probably the one that you should check out. So as always, if you like this channel, please hit the like button for these videos. It helps me out a lot. Share, subscribe to the channel. It's really going to benefit what we're trying to do here and what we're trying to accomplish. Hope you enjoyed the video. Lastly, I want to discuss um, something that I feel like is really, it's, it's always been in the hobby, but is really becoming a lot more mainstream, and that's just bioactive enclosures, and what it, what is it? So, I, I don't know if, if that's worth um, talking about at this time, but we all know what it is, but what, how is that good for our animals? Is it good for our animals? What's... What's up with bioactive? Uh, and we'll, we'll stick with you, uh, Riley, if you could speak to that. And then we'll, we'll, we'll hear from everyone. So I'll, I'll freely admit that I am new to the whole learning the bioactive scene. Um, I kind of have like an understanding and the gist of it, you know, you're essentially creating uh, live soil, live ecosystem for your animals with a balance of like cleanup crew plants and, and there's a, plenty of documented benefits um, and you know again being species specific it can be really helpful uh, I've I've set up enclosures in zoos that sort of became established with live plants long enough where they turned into bioactive namely like dark frog enclosures um, different uh, you know tropical animals just springtails found their way in some Australian frogs things like that and so it's sort of I can see the benefit with the cleanup crew and they can generate some extra humidity and things. And so I can see it being beneficial and, and, and you know, probably harmless to a lot of species, but um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Like if I were to do that, I, I think it would just be a lot more work. And I know some twitchy animals that probably would be annoyed with having bugs crawling all over them. And, you know, if you're talking about doing it with some small in invertebrates like tarantulas, your cleanup crew is going to get eaten. So I don't think it works in every scenario. And I also think if you really wanted to have like something that can handle the waste load of a species, like say a blood python, it's just not going to work. Um, but otherwise, I don't know enough about it to like, you know, be all that fancy with it but I do see it being popular these days and I don't think there's anything wrong with that as an initiative for new keepers coming in thinking that I should do bioactive because to me that says from right out of the gate they want to go above and beyond and set something up and really go into every facet of husbandry from plants to lighting to all these things and so if that's where they're starting off I think you know kudos to that I don't see anything wrong with that being uh, a part of the, the reptile keeping hobby. But for me, um, you know, it doesn't seem practical on the scale of animals I keep and certain species, but otherwise I think it's awesome. Okay, great. Uh, Mariah, what would, you, what would you say on the topic? First, there are a lot of misconceptions about bioactive. Um, I definitely am still relatively new to it. Um, I, roughly half of my enclosures are bioactive and uh, some of them are enclosures I haven't converted but will. Uh, some of them are enclosures that I did convert and am questioning having converted. And others are enclosures that I haven't converted and probably never will. Um, there, a lot of people think that bioactive and naturalistic are the same thing, but the thing is they're not. Naturalistic simply means that you are seeking to recreate the animal's habitat for its own benefit 
not simply because you want something pretty to display in your living room. There's a big difference. You can have something uh, that looks nice and natural when it's actually not natural at all for the animal and they can't use it the way that they're meant to use uh, their territory. Uh, bioactive is simply taking naturalistic, taking that slice of nature and making it functional on a biological level. Um, so for example, you can't really do a true bioactive with fake plants. I tried, it's very hard to keep stable. Um, granted, that's only one case, <laughs> you need more, but live plants play a big role in soil health and in regulating humidity and oxygen levels and keeping away the bad bacteria and fungi and encouraging the good ones. Uh, you have, you know, your cleanup crew, but you don't just have isopods and springtails in nature. You have a variety of cleanup crew bugs that all play a role. Also, do you have the beneficial fungi and bacteria in the soil? Um, a lot of people don't take that into consideration. They're just like, put some dirt in it, put some plants in it, put some, put a reptile in it and you're good. And I was like, no, you need to seed it with the right germs, so to speak, uh, to make it functional on a microbiology level. Uh, so there's a lot of work that goes into it. And ov obviously the lighting and everything else, it's complicated to recreate nature, not just in appearance, but also in function. Um, so it's doable. I think it's great um, for me, since I have a growing collection, it is very nice to not have to worry so much about having to totally strip an enclosure and replace what is often, you know, a hundred pounds of substrate or more and keep things a little bit more stable, keep things less stressful from me having just always being in my reptile space. Like for example, my morning geckos, yeah, if I had to strip that if once a quarter, that would be nearly impossible. I'd be losing geckos left and right. I have that bioactive for a reason, and it's so I can keep them safely, uh, <laughs> keep them safely self-maintaining, more or less, with maintenance. Uh, but, you know, for my snakes, uh, waste load is totally a thing. And on the one hand, it's tempting to go bioactive because... They like to poo where I can't see it. And so I really have to go on a hunt, the lamest Easter egg hunt ever. Mm. And so it's like, oh, gee, it'd be nice if a cleanup crew could handle this. But the thing is, snakes have big poo. And usually the crew can't handle it. And even in, you know, your average bioactive enclosure, a lot of people think that bioactive means no maintenance. That's totally false. Bioactive just has a different set of maintenance. You are still removing contaminated substrate. You are still removing feces. You are still removing urate. Like you might put it, like leave a little bit in for your cleanup crew, if your cleanup crew can handle it. But say you've got like a Burmese python, a retic, a tegu, uh, a Nile monitor, like, are you kidding me? No, you have to do something uh, to help maintain hygiene. Uh, hygiene and bioactive don't necessarily go hand in hand, uh, so you have to be very careful about that. And then there's plant maintenance, and the list goes on and on. So you really have to know what you're doing when you get into bioactive. So naturalistic, I think, is a really great first step in that direction. What we should be uh, promoting more is let's focus on recreating the animal's natural habitat first. If you want to take the step into bioactive, here are the resources. It's an additional investment. It could be awesome, but you're not necessarily doing less work. Well said. Yeah, excellent. Trace, would you like to add anything on the topic? Yeah, Mariah, I would agree. Like, it's, it's definitely a different set of, of work, different set of husbandry. Uh, I'm super pumped about bioactive. I think it's like the next wave of horticulture. Um, I think it's uh, more enriching for the animals. I think it's better for their gut biome. I think it's better for the entire habitat. And I can relate that, um, you know, directly working in the amphibian conservation area, which is a very large uh, building at the zoo that was closed to the public where we'd reproduce uh, uh, frogs and hellbenders and all kinds of salamanders and stuff for re-release into the wild and for assurance programs. Uh, we had Peltofrini lemur, the Puerto Rican crested toads. Uh, we've released like thousands of tadpoles a year down in Puerto Rico. Um, very early on, 
we were keeping these on like mats, uh, like very like basic, you know, very basic, like, you know, 20 gallon tank with a plastic mat and a little pool of water. And then they, the keeper would pull the plastic mat out every day and bleach it. And these Peltofrini, they had so many issues with, um, you know, they would get like uh, infections and stuff like that. And it was just because they didn't have like the proper bacteria and stuff to help break down. I mean, even though they were getting cleaned all the time, there is a level where you can keep things too clean and too sanitary to an extent. You want to have like kind of a balance going on. Once we move them over to like, uh, like I think Riley, Riley said earlier, like the, a dark frog more set up where you have tons of uh, substrate and you have drainage levels and you have plants and things like that. Uh, yeah, it does, you know, I, I don't know if it's just because they're not exposed to their waste and their nit nitrogen buildup uh, causes issues or if it's more sh like less stressful. Uh, so their immune system is boosted. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a thousand different things, but husbandry wise, I think, I think that's, that's like the next step. And I really think like, you know, if you think about reef keeping, um, there are just a few, they're like a generation ahead of herpticulture and reef keepers all have, you know, like look at all the hermit crabs and all the, you know, you can buy whole cleanup crews and stuff like that to dump into your reef tank and even a lot of your uh, marine fish tanks. And so if we look at them, like they're just, oh, they're just a couple steps ahead of us and like kind of model herpticulture after the things they're doing. Um, I, I think that's the best thing to do. The only thing that I will say as a uh, uh, Department of Agriculture uh, entomologist is isopods are awesome. I love isopods, um, <laughs> but like they can, there are some potential invasive species. And so right now isopods are not insects, they're crustaceans. And so they're kind of flying under the radar of permitting. We're aware of them We're we don't want to pass permits on them, but like as soon as some like soybean farmer calls the USDA and is like, there's all these roly polies eating all my soybean. It's like, okay, that's over. Like we're, these are now all banned. Just like, you know, all the exotic beetles and cool walking sticks and, you know, uh, all of these awesome insects that you see, you know, giant African snails that you see people keep as pets in other countries. Uh, the agriculture here in the United States is such a huge industry. There's no way you can ever, um, they're not going to, bend over backwards for you know roly-poly keepers unfortunately as much as i argue <laughs> so we do have to be very careful of the environment we are you know these these cleanup crews like people i i i know it's happening you know um they're dumping substrate outside full of exotic isopods luckily these isopods don't have wings they're not migrating far and they probably wouldn't survive the winters here that's still an invasive species or could has the potential to be a invasive species and um mm. that could bring a lot of weird laws so like freeze your substrate or don't mm -hmm. dump it outside i hate this i you know and i you know people probably don't want to hear you know they're that they should kill all of the microorganisms and isopods that they enjoyed keeping every time they strip their cage but don't dump it outside like be responsible and, and freeze even that stuff um and I, it sucks i have a huge chest freezer I have to freeze dirt all the time so because uh, I, yeah, I've got some cool isopods too, but and I don't want them to become regulated or quarantine significant. So that's a really good point. Biosecurity is another thing that's flying under the radar with uh, the surge of popularity with bioactive keeping. Yes. A lot of people, and frankly, myself, up to very recently, I was like, yeah, take a log out from the wild, and it's nothing but beneficial microorganisms. <laughs> I'm just gonna stick it into my enclosure, and it's like. No, <laughs> there are lots of things that can potentially harm my reptile. There's lots of things that could potentially uh, cause an imbalance in the ecosystem I'm trying to create. And I love that you mentioned outbound biosecurity as well, not just the inbound, but the outbound. Like we need to be thinking about what are we doing to our local ecosystems? And I love that idea. Like just as, you know, people are, the better keepers are in the habit of sterilizing substrate before they put it into their enclosures because they're worried about mites it's okay, let's sterilize the substrate after we've used it. Like it's one thing if it's not bioactive. It's another thing when it is and it's got all the bugs and the bacteria and the fungi and all of that in it. You don't wanna be exposing your local ecosystem to something because then again, you know, not only damaging local environment, but you could also be causing harm to farmers. I grew up in the Minnesota, North Dakota area. Uh, farmers are near and dear to my heart. Um, and we don't want more restrictive laws than we already have. Yeah, very well said. And that, that reminds me, when I worked at Santa Barbara, we had an APHIS permit even for the zoo just to have um, certain insects uh, and invertebrates in our collection. And 
namely the uh, the giant cave roaches and Madagascar hissing cockroaches and uh, African giant millipedes. Anytime we did substrate changes, we would uh, dump all the substrate or uh, exoskeletons separately into bags and freeze them in, a, in an ultra low at like negative 72 degrees centic or Celsius. And uh, just like freezing the bejesus out of this stuff for 72 hours. And then it could go off to a company that would then in a controlled setting incinerate it. So it would not have any chance of getting out. And it's, it's really funny because at reptile shows, even in California, you can just buy hissing cockroaches and millipedes. And I guarantee you people are just ditching all the substrate. And if you ever get millipedes and they breed, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of eggs and babies that get out and you never know what you're going to do. And so, yeah, that's, that's not even talked about in the hobby sector really. Um, and it's, it's a scary thing. So, you know, for me personally, like at one point, uh, we had a, a hissing cockroach and, and I think I still have, uh, dirt frozen in my freezer just because like, hmm. even just at home for that one roach, that's, you know, better safe than sorry. And it's just good practice all around. And, yeah, we got to think about the final steps as well. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that SOP. Like, yeah, that's, that's who I work for. So that's that's cool. Yeah, to hear. I, I will it. say just oh, I'm sorry. I, I will say since we are on video, uh, I think that they APHIS and uh, Plant Protection Quarantine has written 30 uh, species of cockroaches that are so common in the pet trade and and uh, that you no longer need permits for. So oh, uh, nice. and mostly because people, just so many people had like. Madagascar's and cockroaches and dubia, they, they no longer require any type of quarantine significant permits. Now, other other species of cockroaches, other species of, you know, insects and stuff uh, do. And even you guys are in California, there's a invasive species of uh, Indian walking stick, Carousia mm -hmm. sclerosis is mm -hmm. there. It's like, there's no males or parthenogenic. They just, they just squirt out eggs, just con there's little egg ma makers. So great chameleon food. So if you can get a colony of those, <laughs> since they're, they're there, yeah. you know, but um that's great uh fascinating stuff on a lot of and i think uh one of the funny things that won't show up in the youtube video because it just highlights the speaker when a lot of us were speaking well, a lot of you guys were speaking um i noticed that the other participants were always thrown out like so i just want <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that for the recording that, that there was a lot of positive re reaffirmation even though it didn't come through verbally Okay, thanks for watching this far, guys. If you enjoyed what you saw, don't forget to hit the like and the subscribe button. Again, it really helps out what we're trying to accomplish with this channel. I really liked what Trace had to say about going bioactive. And, and just more importantly, the biosecurity aspect of it. Not just thinking about what we do when we bring stuff in from the wild, but making sure that we're not letting stuff go. Um, as we know now, you know, isopods, there's a lot of different species and they've been mixed all over the world because of soil and plants and things like that so there's a lot of species already mixed out where they shouldn't be but you're never too certain what animal is going to suddenly take over in an environment and the bigger effects it has on the ecosystem right we could do a whole lesson on the food chain the food web and how some of the smallest discrepancies can really throw everything up for a loop um, so it's, I, I really love that you brought up that biosecurity and i really hope you guys enjoyed learning something see you next time